Coming up on In the Life, gay and lesbian leaders in the White House and the House of Representatives, on the federal bench, and in small town America. They know me and accept me for who I am. Oscar nominated actor Sir Ian McKellen takes us on a night out. All this and more on this edition of In the Life, America's gay and lesbian cultural news magazine. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Gill Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, the Collingwood Foundation, the Rainbow Endowment, William J. Resnick, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. I'm Katherine Linton. In the last decade, an unprecedented number of gay men and lesbians have begun to serve openly in a broad spectrum of leadership roles, from the courts to Congress, from City Hall to the White House. Both their jobs and constituencies are as diverse as their own backgrounds, dispelling the myth of a monolithic gay community with a single agenda. Over the last 10 years, we've covered many of these leaders, the perennial newsmakers, as well as those lesser known. On this episode, we'll revisit some of these stories and take you from the White House to the House of Representatives and beyond the Beltway. Correspondent Jonathan Capehart introduces us to the first openly gay judge appointed to a federal bench. Special guest RuPaul remembers a civil rights hero. Bayard Rustin was eventually forced out of his leadership position because of his homosexuality. Tanya Barfield reports on author and activist Keith Boykin and Neil Miller meets the mayor of a Everybody small Missouri town. But first, when Virginia Puzo went to work for Bill Clinton, she had already been a highly visible gay activist for more than three decades. As a member of the Clinton administration, she became the highest ranking openly gay official in government. In 1987, Virginia was arrested in front of the White House. Ten years later, she was running it. So why don't we go around the table and just do our thing. Okay, so, Brooks, what do we have? Um, yesterday, I distributed the Mustang parking permit. As assistant to the president, Apuzo is responsible for the smooth running of all White House functions, from the daily operations. Room 1 actually just prepared a draft package of I'm new to the complex or I'm moving right. that will help. To Clinton's recent trip to Africa. As we <coughs> walked through the village, we looked at um, the various little businesses. And 25 years ago, would you have ever imagined yourself here? No, I didn't imagine myself here 25 weeks ago. <laughs> uh, no, this is a, uh, you don't, I, I don't think you begin as a uh, Afghan person in government. Um, thinking that someday you'll end up at the White House. As a gay person myself, I would have never imagined an out lesbian in the White House. How do people react? I mean, are people... Well, most people say a lesbian ex-nun in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the issue for them. And yet Apuzo has successfully combined a long career in government with her gay rights activism. In 1976 and 1980, she coordinated the National Gay Task Force efforts to get a plank in the Democratic Party platform. By the time it got to be 1980, there was a foundation for some of the work to be done. There was the threat of Reagan uh, defeating Carter. The Democratic Party finally saw that we were not just an issue that was embarrassing candidate Carter, but a constituency that was pivotal if President Carter was to prevail. After that, I supported Governor Cuomo's run for the governor, and at that time was very tempted to join his administration. Um, he had made it known that I would be welcome in the administration, and just at that time, I um, was asked to take on the role of executive director of the National Gay Task Force. 
Then the movement exploded in the 80s, and I was there and privileged to serve during those times. Apuzo got her chance to work for Governor Cuomo in 1985 on the Consumer Protection Board, where she continued her work on the emerging AIDS issues. I'd been doing advocacy work at Consumer Protection around the cost of AIDS drugs, as well as um, uh, everything from morticians who wouldn't take corpses. Uh, people couldn't have their loved ones uh, provided a funeral despite their willingness to pay and everything. They just, you know, we, we had to fight every step of the way. So when activists planned a protest against President Reagan's AIDS policies, Apuzo wanted to be there. I'd been there locally in New York, and I'd been there lobbying Congress for the first um, hearings on AIDS. We'd been to the FDA. And now there was a protest at the White House, but I was a government official. So I did it, and I was arrested. And it was one of my proudest moments to be able to cross a line and have it mean that, okay, you know, we're willing to go up against and beyond the law to say this is wrong. Fortunately, I was a government official in Mario Cuomo's administration, and Mario Cuomo is the kind of person who understands when an issue is a matter of conscience. This is a shot during a, a press conference with uh, Governor Cuomo, and I love the shot because it's very clear that Mario Cuomo is actually listening. <laughs> now, usually, usually Mario Cuomo is talking and pointing. In this picture, I'm pointing and talking, and Mario Cuomo is listening. So I kind of like that picture. Her arrest was not a problem for Clinton, either. Now, as assistant to the president, her days are filled with meetings. Work before work and work after work, but, but the day generally is filled from 7.45 in the morning until 6, 7 o'clock at night with meetings. Uh, one meeting after another meeting after another meeting. And she uses her role to continue to raise the issues of gay and lesbian civil rights. As managers, are we ready for what diversity really, you know, needs to mean in the 21st century? And is the institution prepared, once people are here, mm -hmm. to provide what is needed? And I talk only from my own experience. As a, as a lesbian, are people pre are, is the government prepared for spousal benefits. Do I have an opportunity to say this is important? Yeah. I mean, take the fact that the president uh, went a couple of months ago to the human rights campaign dinner. I had the opportunity to drive over with the president and to talk to him about issues of concern to gays and lesbians and was delighted to see that, you know, the president was there. I said, you know, look, a lot of people have emailed me and said, this is a very important thing you're doing. And, you know, the president said, I'm happy to be doing it. It's the right thing to do. And do I have an abiding astonishment over the fact every night when I walk out and see the White House? Yeah. I grew up in the 40s and 50s in the Bronx. You know, I've been called every name under the book in my life, you know, Dyke. And from there, from people who never said it with love and caring. I've been an outlaw in 22 states, you know. Lesbians and gays are felons in 22 states in this country. Am I pleased? I'm delighted. As an American, how do I feel? I never thought we'd be here now, but I know that the vision for the administration is to keep moving forward, and so I've got my eye on where we can go. Virginia Puzo is now retired, but remains active in progressive organizations. She serves on the board of the Empire State Pride Agenda and volunteers for Planned Parenthood. Leadership is a contentious issue in the lesbian and gay community, and it raises many tough questions, like who are the leaders, whom do they represent, and to whom are they accountable? Recently, The Advocate, a national gay magazine, asked in a reader poll, who do you think should lead the gay and lesbian movement, providing what many felt were some arbitrary choices, including none of the above. The poll received mixed reactions particularly from some of the candidates. I was surprised that The Advocate presented that poll as part of the original article. Um, it, I thought, gee, they haven't read my chapter on leadership. I don't think anyone at The Advocate 
thought it was a serious poll. I voted for none of the above. I was really actually hoping for Miss Congeniality. <laughs> you know? Although the actual poll was not taken too seriously, the problems facing leadership were. And in terms of the question, who should be the one leader of the gay community, the answer from the leaders we spoke to was unanimous. No one. We need to actually move away from um, enshrining one person as the epitome, as the leader for the entire movement and look much more locally at the many leaders we have and, and look also at cultivating and developing and training new leadership. AIDS has taught us a very valuable lesson. It taught us that leadership can come and it can go very quickly. And so when we place all of our hopes in one leaders, we are actually abdicating responsibility ourselves. I think we have made a colossal error historically thinking that gay and lesbian issues are left issues, that they are only liberal issues. Gay and, les gay and lesbian Americans live along the political continuum. If your question is, would I be a good leader of the entire gay and lesbian movement? Probably not. No, I think we're, and, I, and at the same time, uh, more left uh, leaders would not be good leaders of the Law Cabin Group. And we may never agree on one vision, and I don't think we will. I mean, certainly you look at the gay Republicans, and they very much believe in the vision of America that Newt Gingrich offers this country. And, you know, that's not a vision I agree with. While it's clear that there is a need for multiple leaderships, there still exists an underlying problem. Most gays and lesbians can't identify even the current crop of leaders, much less their organizations. Some of the frustration that I see around leadership, particularly since I've left the Beltway, I'm more attuned to it, um, is, the, is the sense that there's a real clubby uh, kind of leadership and it doesn't really interested in hearing what the ordinary person has to say. And it isn't really interested in you if you don't have money. We have, I think, fairly isolated uh, national organizations and we have a plethora, a grand plethora of, hundred, of thousands literally thousands of lesbian gay rights organizations jumping up all over the country and we have no effective coordination among them. What I see is a tremendous distrust among grassroots activists of the Washington-based movement. Most of our organizations don't have chapters, they don't have annual conventions, um, they don't have a way for members to participate. But the challenges lie not only with the leaders themselves, but also with the task they face unifying a diverse and often fragmented community. In our movement and in the progressive movement in general, I think that we have organized around identity, racial identity, um, and even the gay and lesbian movement is itself an identity-based movement. We are trying to unite constituencies that um, have, on the surface, little connection between them. A labor movement, a women's movement, a lesbian gay rights movement, a people of color movement. Uh, which have real long-standing and deep divisions between them, and it is very difficult to overcome them. Maybe we need to form a gay and lesbian agenda 2000, which is about dealing with homophobia, racism, and sexism, and makes no bones about it. But I think we must make coalitions with other groups that we bring the gift that we have learned from our oppression to the society as a whole. Finally, in a move that might be perceived as ironic, Gay and lesbian leaders now say they must go back to their roots, the grassroots organizing that has been so effective for the radical right. I'm confused about the Christian rights model. On the one hand, I think that their training of activists has been very effective, and I'd love to replicate that. On the other hand, their, um, the, the way they, the right wing doesn't believe in critical thinking. <laughs> They, they systematically attack the idea of questioning and pluralism and dissent. There's one thing that we all must do regardless of anything else. We have got to build a field operation in, this or, in, in the country and we've never done it. We've had a lot of smoke and mirrors. We have had the illusion of a field. We've had an illusion of a kind of piece of machinery that can honor constituency power. There is no there there, and we should stop pretending there is. The radical right has been very effective in packaging our goals as special rights, and I feel like we have not been equally effective in packaging our goals as what we do want. Our goal for the next five years really is an education campaign. We're engaging in our party. Obviously, the rise of the far right is most prevalent in our party, and I think that 
uh, as we succeed or fail, will have a large measure on uh, an effect on the rest of the gay and lesbian communities. I believe we need words and symbols that are as deeply rooted and resonant in the American psyche as anything the radical right can come up with. I do think we have a, a vision of a gay and lesbian agenda, and I think that's where we can come together, progressive and conservative alike, around our vision for gay people. But the larger vision thing, <laughs> to quote my favorite guy, George Bush, not. Um, the larger vision question of, you know, what are we for? What do we want um, in a broad way? I don't think that gay people have begun to answer that. Currently, the executive director of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force is Lori Jean, and Irva Shivad is at the Ford Foundation. Both Elizabeth Birch and Rich Taffel remain in their posts. When I was 15 years old and growing up in Cincinnati, Ohio, I snuck into a matinee showing of a movie called Making Love. It starred Michael Ankeen as a married doctor coming out of the closet, and Harry Hamlin played a very out and proud book author. Uh, Kate Jackson was in it too. There was a scene where Michael and Harry kissed and fell onto a bed. At that moment, I realized I wasn't alone. In fact, I was going to be just fine. Thank you for that, Michael and Harry. I'm Scott C. Oman, and you're watching In the Life. The original march on Washington in 1963, led by Dr. Martin Luther King, was a seminal event in the struggle for civil rights. What many people don't know is that the chief organizer of that march was a gay man. Bayard Rustin was eventually forced out of his leadership position because of his homosexuality. In 1996, series host Catherine Linton traveled to Atlanta, Georgia for Martin Luther King Day. There, she talked to one woman determined to keep the spirit of Bayard Rustin's work alive. To describe another great man, Bayard Rustin. I'm here with Charlene Kaufman, organizer of the Bayard Rustin Rally. Charlene, why is it important to honor Bayard Rustin today, and why is it important that this contingent march openly in the march? This is very important, particularly here in the South, in Atlanta, with all eyes on Atlanta that the gay and lesbian movement be a part of the civil rights movement, as well as, and more specifically, the African-American gay and lesbian community take homage of Baird Rustin being an out black gay man back in the 40s. We need that as a positive role model to help, us, to help break up the silence. Baird Rustin found himself ostracized from the very community to which he was so devoted simply because of his homosexuality. Today, however, 33 years later, we find gay African-American leaders and organizations striving to educate all communities about issues of race and sexuality. One emerging leader is the head of the National Black Lesbian and Gay Leadership Forum, Keith Boykin. Here's Tanya Barfield with the story. The National Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum was founded in 1988 as a means to combat racism, sexism, and homophobia. Keith Boykin was fresh out of college in 88. He then went on to law school, held positions on two presidential campaigns, and worked for two years in the Clinton White House before becoming the Leadership Forum's executive director this past year. Today, through education programs and coalition building, Boykin and the Leadership Forum work to strengthen existing institutions for black gay men and lesbians and bridge the gaps between diverse communities and identities. Much of our work as an organization is in educating the various communities that the members are part of. So for example, we would go to the black community and educate them about uh, homosexuality and homophobia. We'd go to the gay and lesbian community and educate them also about racism and about the, the causes and concerns of African Americans. So there is a duality that takes place and we, uh, we work on sort of bridging the gap between the two communities that we represent. From my, pers my personal perspective, it's important not to, to uh, fall into the trap of creating a hierarchy of oppression where one part of your identity becomes uh, less important than another part. Uh, Mel Boozer, who spoke at the 1980 Democratic Convention as an openly gay uh, representative from the District of Columbia, 
made a statement that I think is very profound and, and reaches me as well. He said, I know what it feels like to be called nigger, and I know what it feels like to be called faggot, and I can sum up the difference in one word, none. Boykin joined the Clinton White House staff in 1992 when he was hired by George Stephanopoulos. While there, he often worked on issues of concern to the gay and lesbian community, and he was instrumental in organizing the landmark White House meeting between Clinton and gay leaders in the spring of 93. He left the White House in 1994 and began work on his first book. The book is called One More River to Cross, uh, Black and Gay in America, which will be published by Doubleday this year. The purpose of the book, when I, st when I set out to write it, was to describe the experience of what it feels like to be both black and gay. I interviewed hundreds of different people from across the country, some, whom were, some of whom were black and some were not, some were gay and some were straight. I learned that black people are not as homophobic as people seem to think that they are, that we are. Uh, in fact, my, my analysis seems to indicate that blacks are probably in, less homophobic than, than other communities. We have to make sure that we understand that the black community is also the community that elects, by and large, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, who are, for the most part, the most supportive group in Congress of any demographic group on gay and lesbian issues. On the morning of October 16, 1995, about 300 black gay men took part in the Million Man March. We weren't quite sure how we would be received that day, but as we marched through the streets carrying signs and placards that announced that we were both black and gay, we gained confidence. As we arrived at the site of the march, the group of people assembled greeted us with applause and cheers and support. We learned something valuable from that experience. We learn that when we have the courage to be open and honest about who we are, people in our communities not only accept us, they respect us more. I'm Keith Boykin, and you're watching In the Life. We are sisters and sisters, brothers and brothers, workers and lovers. We are together, we are marching. Recently acclaimed as Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, Sir Ian McKellen demonstrated his own brand of leadership with the 1994 show, A Night Out. If that title's got any width to it at all, it is that it nicely encapsules the two sides of my life. One, one is, one is the, the mainstream actor who's pursued that career pretty heavily for the majority of his career, and the outside is, is uh, the other side of me, which frankly is, is, is the main part of my life at the moment, the activist rather than the actor. In 1991, Sir Ian made history as the first openly gay man to be knighted. What a wonderful opportunity uh, to use the knighthood, the stamp of the establishment's authority against the establishment and say, uh, I am a gay man, you've given me a knighthood, why do you persist in having laws which discriminate against me uh, and my brothers and sisters? With a night out, Sir Ian publicly voiced his identity as both actor and activist. That the world is never going to be entirely reconciled to the existence of homosexuality until every lesbian and gay man in the world comes out and tells the truth about himself. <laughs> He does, however, realize the difficulty of being out in the entertainment industry. Because they're under pressure from their agents and managers and indeed the advertisers who present the commercials in between the shows they appear in on television, um, educate them to lie uh, in order to perpetuate the bigger lie that we're all the same. Well, we're not all the same. We're all different, thank God. And it's the diversity of life which we should be celebrating, not, um, not the sameness. Dear Ian, I'm a 53-year-old married man. My wife and I have shared everything, never had any secrets except for one. Since a very young age, 11 to 12 years, I have known that I felt different. Uh, as for people younger than me, uh, they probably have much less of a problem in being out. 
because the ground has been prepared for them by, by other people who they should respect and remember, and if they don't know anything about them, should learn about. And if they are boogieing down in the clubs and the bars and they think, uh, what does it matter? What does the gay rights movement matter? Why should I contribute the odd dollar? Why should I go on the march? Why should I read uh, a, a political paper from the gay point of view? Uh, then they too are missing out because there are millions of gays and lesbians in this country uh, who are not lucky enough to go to clubs and bars, who daren't pick up your, your magazine. Uh, who feel they would be sacked from their job if it were known they were gay. And uh, you only realize you've got a responsibility to those, to those people who you'll never meet uh, when you realize that you've got a responsibility to yourself. And that responsibility is to get out of the closet. And uh, we all know it's not easy. But when you do, you'll find there are so many friends there to support you and help you. So that's my message. Now we are shouting our own words. We are a community. We are a society. We are everyone. We are inside you. Remember all you were taught to forget. We are part of the new world. Hi, I'm Wesley Snipes. Hello, I'm Susan Sarandon. This is Petula Clark. Pete Seeger. David Marshall Grant. Quentin Chris. Jason Alexander. We're Betty. And you're watching. You're watching. You are watching. America's Emmy-nominated gay and lesbian news magazine. In the life. In the life. In the life. Now, I think that's fabulous. Sabrina Sojourner made history as the first out African-American lesbian to be elected to the U.S. Congress as a non-voting or shadow representative from the District of Columbia. This is Brooklyn. This is one of the oldest neighborhoods in the District of Columbia, and it originally was the suburbs of Washington, D.C. I have lived here for five out of the six years that I've been living in Washington, D.C. Brooklyn is about 70% black, uh, about 6 to 8% Latino, has about 2% Asian, and then the rest white. And that is about what the demographics of, this, of Washington, D.C. are. I moved here six years ago, and I suddenly had to face something. I had to give up my right to having representation in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. National delegation, Chrissy speaking. May I help you? As the U.S. shadow representative from D.C., Sabrina is lobbying to gain representation there are a lot of people who really don't know that we don't have a vote in the House of Representatives and don't know that we don't have any senators. They don't think about it and they just don't know. And so uh, our big job is to raise the education level and the understanding level of both people in the Congress and in the country and around the world. Ironically, Washington, D.C., home of the federal government, is the only place in the country whose citizens have no voice. All decisions that impact the district are made by Congress, none of whom represent the district. There are literally thousands of decisions that are made that fully and solely impact the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia is one of the places in one of the jurisdictions that allows adoption by lesbian and gay couples. And every year that there's a Congress that doesn't like us, that those particular regulations are put in jeopardy. And Congress should have nothing to say about that. For Sabrina, representing the interests of D.C. residents does not happen from behind a desk. She goes to the source. First stop, Tyler Elementary School. Kids Safe is a kids safety program. I want everybody to say 911. One, three. One, two, three. 911. Next stop, a meeting at the University of the District of Columbia to strategize about securing a school budget threatened by the City Financial Control Board. Okay. It's outrageous that we in the District of Columbia should be deprived of public higher education access because people don't think that it's important for us to have it. 
A late lunch was reserved for Robert Chan, a student intern with the Office of Asian American Pacific Islander Affairs. Sabrina's ability to outreach to different communities reflects her own multiple identities. I am a woman, a single mother, I'm a feminist, I'm African American, I'm Cherokee. And as chronicled in her book, Psychic Scars and Other Mad Thoughts, I'm also a survivor of sexual abuse. And I think that all of those things have come together to create who I am in a way that gives me a depth and breadth of understanding of of how oppression in particular works. With all of these concerns, Sabrina still has to face her own backyard. Last year, I had done all of this tilling and planting, anticipating spending my entire summer gardening. And then, you know, a few community people and some friends had this idea about me running for office. And by the time I got all the petition signatures in, all of this was like so incredibly overgrown. It was amazing. Finally, Sabrina's partner, Letitia, comes home to get ready for the evening's event. Mm -hmm. So what's on tap for tonight, the, the dinner, right? Yep. And uh, it's black tie optional, so. OK, good. Well, <laughs> I don't have black tie, so. If there was ever a moment in my life where I felt like the world was my oyster, it is this moment. Certainly, before I decided to do this, no one saw an open African-American lesbian in this kind of a political position. I know that you've entrusted me with not just your vote and not just your personal support, but a large expectation about doing something different with this position. I don't want you to know I'm going to do my best not to let you down. Thank you. Sabrina remains active in gay and minority causes. Although she is no longer with her partner, she is now a grandmother and plans to publish a new collection of her writing later this year. Still to come on In the Life, a gay judge lays down the law. This matter is adjourned. And Tammy Baldwin goes to Washington, but first. The leaders we profiled in the first half of the show were all based in Washington, D.C., but gay men and lesbians have risen to power in places throughout the country, including some that might surprise you. Bunston, Missouri is about as far away from the Beltway as you can get when it comes to gay visibility, or so we thought until author Neil Miller traveled there in 1995 and met the town's long-term mayor. I grew up in Cooper County, uh, pretty much. I come here when I was six, been here all the rest of my life. Never left except for Vietnam. I would describe Bunsen as a very small farming community in, in the center, the heart of Missouri. I knew I was gay probably at the age of 12. Well, it was pretty rough because it was, everybody was very closeted about it and I thought, actually I thought I was the only one, so. I met Larry through The Advocate. I put an ad in The Advocate and uh, we met on uh, Labor Day weekend, and I knew right then I was in love, and I wanted him with me the rest of my life, so he moved in a month later, and we've been together 22 years. Everywhere we went, we were together. We never kissed in public or held hands, but we were together all the time, and people just accepted him. I'm sure there's people that definitely would disapprove of my lifestyle, but as a whole, they know me and accept me for who I am and what I've done for the community. I ran for mayor in the beginning because there were things in this town that weren't getting done. I wanted senior housing. I wanted a good fire department. I'm in my eighth term now, which is over 15 years of mayorship in the community here. I have to work elsewhere for a living. Bunston pays me $3 a year as mayor. 
when I get 20 years in, I think that's enough, which would be 10 terms. I think somebody else should do it for a while then. You're known as the, the mayor with his hand out. Is that true? I think down in Jeff City, they, they refer to me as the mayor with his hand out because I'm always down there for grants and, and any monies that are available. So, as in as a small town with a lot of minorities and uh, low income and elderly, we qualify. So I pursue it. <laughs> right. The first thing I applied for was a housing rehab grant on the south side of 268000 um, then we applied for another well. I got 10,000 or 58,000 for that, and I got 10,000 for a park, $350,000 for a sewer and lagoon system, and the latest is another housing rehab on the north side of town of 211,000, which puts it over a million dollars. The caboose has been my latest project since our town was founded on the railroad. The railroad was actually here before the town. I thought that would be an important piece of history to have, so I pursued that and Union Pacific saw fit to donate us a caboose and we got it and got it painted and we're working now to finish the inside and make a museum out of it. I don't see myself as a role model at all, but I think the gay community does see me that way. They think I'm important, I don't. I think I'm just a human being like everybody else and trying to do what's right for my community. I do things totally different, I'm sure, than, than most in the gay community. I believe that you can kill people with kindness I would like to see the gay community reach out and build a bridge between themselves and the straight community because we all have to be together. We have to live together, we have to work together, and we have to form a community together. Currently, Gene is running for his 12th term as mayor. He has already served 21 consecutive years, and he and his partner Larry have been together for 29. <laughs> I'll never forget the moment when I first fell in love. For me it was as if I'd been eating hamburgers all my life, and probably hot dogs is a better metaphor. And then suddenly someone gave me the most exquisite, the most delicious filet mignon, which for a vegetarian is kind of a strange metaphor. But in that moment I knew in my heart, I knew in my soul, I knew in every fiber and every cell of my body that being gay wasn't wrong and it wasn't sinful and it wasn't an illness and it wasn't an abomination. And in fact, it was so beautiful that from that day on, there wasn't a priest, there wasn't a minister, there wasn't a rabbi, an imam, or even a pope in this world that could tell me otherwise. I'm Christian de la Huerta, and you're watching In the Life. In recent years, a number of openly gay men and lesbians have been appointed to federal positions. For our Gay Pride 2000 episode, Jonathan Capehart reported on a judge whose appointment was a landmark decision. Recent legal gains for gay men and lesbians seem to indicate a shift in attitude toward public acceptance. From the civil union law in Vermont that grants same-sex couples many of the benefits of marriage, to the legal challenge against the anti-gay policy of the Boy Scouts of America that has reached all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Another barometer in this shifting climate is the number of federal appointments of openly gay and lesbian public servants. In our next segment, we profile one such individual, a judge who presides over a federal bench in New York City. My name is Deborah A. Batt, and my title is United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York. How many doctors have been involved? As a district court judge, I have jurisdiction over an incredible variety of cases. I have civil cases as well as criminal cases. The Honorable Deborah Batts became the country's first openly gay federal judge in 1994, having been recommended for the bench by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York. I was asked if I would be interested in submitting an application to be considered for a federal uh, district court judgeship. Uh, I was delighted. I said yes. I was sent the application. Uh, I filled it out. Uh, I met with Senator Moynihan. However, change in the country's political climate was necessary before the application was given serious consideration. 
the Bush Department of Justice or administration felt that while they thought I was very nice, that my view of what a federal judge should be was not uh, what their view of a federal judge should be. The President of the United States. When President Clinton was elected in 1992, Batts' nomination finally moved forward. Early on, the administration made clear that they wanted to seek out a diverse slate of candidates, including openly gay or lesbian uh, candidates for the federal bench. Finally, I was nominated by uh, President Clinton and uh, was sworn in as a federal district court judge June 23, 1994, which was during Gay Pride Week. The ease with which an openly gay candidate won confirmation to the federal bench took many legal observers by surprise. Please be seated. Still many felt that her confirmation had more to do with her credentials than it did with a tolerant Congress. Bats was an openly lesbian tenured professor at Fordham Law School who had taught there for, I, I think, 10 or more years and um, had a very uh, prestigious resume before that. She was at a prestigious law firm. She worked at the U.S. Attorney. This matter is adjourned. Bats studied government at Radcliffe College, then went on to graduate from Harvard Law School at a time when radical changes were sweeping the country. I think that the timing of it, the assassination of Robert uh, Kennedy, the assassination of Martin Luther King, the uh, Vietnamese War, the uh, uh, problems that the country was roiling in at that time, that was a very, very strong influence uh, in terms of deciding that that's what I wanted to do. So that's why I wound up uh, in law school at the time. Presidential appointments to the federal bench are decidedly political and are part of an administration's legacy. But Bat says a judge's job is to steer clear of politics and offer a fair interpretation of the law. Are they coming in tomorrow? The federal judgeship is a lifetime appointment, but I do think that the system of checks and balances works. Judges stay out of the policy-making role and get into the fray or come into action once the legislature has done its job. One place where BATS is able to be more vocal on the ways gays and lesbians continue to be denied equal protection under the law is at Fordham University, where she is a visiting professor. Her courses have focused on family law, marriage, and adoption. If we all agree that families and marriage, for instance, uh, provides positive uh, effects on the individuals who are part of them, uh, then one might wonder what legitimate interest uh, the state would have in, in preventing individuals who wish to uh, take advantage of those relationships. So listen, guys, if we could uh, come in in about five or ten minutes or so and do the sign as, as a private person and as a mother. All right, great. Uh, anybody who wants to do and experience what I have should be given every opportunity to do so. Working toward getting more openly gay and lesbian individuals appointed at the federal level is a slow and contentious process, but a crucial one that can lead to social change. There are ways that judges can create social change, and one is simply by the example of that they are there and that they are in a very revered, prominent position in our society as an openly gay person. And in and of itself, that is social change, and it inspires social change. A judge uh, requires being viewed as fair and impartial, so that political action is is something that we are not really able to do as judges but we still are people on the next edition of in the life saving lives in the la unified school district that's what project 10 meant to me and if it wasn't for that i think a lot of us would have ended up dead a lot of us would have killed ourselves fighting for rights in the aftermath of 9 11 and harvey Firestein rattles the closet door uh, carry on carry on Tammy Baldwin's election to the House of Representatives in 1998 proved that a politician can be out and still get elected. And the historic and sometimes contentious race brought a little more diversity to the House on Capitol Hill. We're empty. We're tired. We want our rights now. One of the most important fights being waged in the area of human rights in the world today is the fight in America over gay and lesbian rights. The progress we make really resonates worldwide. And Tammy Baldwin is ideally placed to be a major participant in that fight. How much do we value our children? 
our families, and the professionals who care for them. Because she is such a good combination of, of tough-mindedness and idealism. Yeah, we should. I think. A native of Madison, Wisconsin, like Tammy Baldwin began her career in elective politics 12 years ago, serving four terms in the Dane County Board of Supervisors and three terms in the Wisconsin State Assembly. In 1998, the 36-year-old open lesbian decided to go national. On Tuesday, November 3rd, send Tammy Baldwin to Congress. I've always been very excited by public service. At some point, I asked a question of myself. Would, would I be um, more um, influential? Would I have more impact and effect if I stayed in the Wisconsin State Legislature or if I took this risk and this leap? And I, I ultimately determined that I could have a bigger impact if elected to Congress. We need people like Tammy Baldwin who will remind us, who will challenge us, who will constantly tell us that we can do better. Though she received early support from First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, there were still questions about whether being an out lesbian made Tammy Baldwin a viable candidate. In my campaign for Congress, um, there was a moment during the primary election where I thought, um, we weren't going to be able to talk about anything else. It was a six-way Republican primary, and one candidate got involved in that race, bound and determined to make the issue the only issue in his campaign. When he did so, he was so universally criticized and condemned for making this an election about, um, about hate politics um, that it, in many ways that issue uh, disappeared as a central theme. Tammy Baldwin will take on issues that congressmen don't deal with. Like Voters were pretty clear about telling me what they were concerned about. People were talking to me about health care, and they were talking to me about education. Like fighting to protect our senior social security from risky Wall Street investment schemes. And ensuring that our kids will have a guaranteed quality public education. The thing that was most distinct about Tammy was her refusal to be trapped in the corners of American politics. What made her campaign unique was a determination to play it her way. John Nichols from Madison's Capital Times wrote some of the earliest pro-Baldwin editorials. So often in, in any media coverage it would say, Tammy Baldwin, comma, the first openly lesbian candidate for Congress from Wisconsin, comma. That was like her full name, right? But as the campaign went on, that started not appearing anymore. And um, she was able to break through and be referred to as Tammy Baldwin, Democratic candidate for Congress. So there's a real ambivalence now. Tammy Baldwin was also endorsed by Congressman Barney Frank and the Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund, which raised more than $100,000 for her campaign. We have been helping Tammy, uh, certainly from day one, but at every level, uh, giving her technical support if she needed it, uh, serving as a resource here in Washington. Serving as a cheerleader, quite honestly, is a big deal. Uh, you know, getting the message out there that she can win. In addition to the support of the power players in Washington, an estimated 3,000 volunteers were recruited locally. If you went into her campaign office, there were people who were over 70 stuffing envelopes, but there were also a tremendous number of people in their late teens, early 20s, some of whom took off a semester of college just to work for Tammy Baldwin. Well, I had an internship at the campaign through the political science department, and Basically, I would go there about 10 hours a week during the spring semester. My role was that I worked on, on campus trying to essentially get the people in the dorms, the people who had just moved to the Madison area, to go out and vote. I formed the student organization Students for Tammy Baldwin and basically starting to recruit volunteers, students to get excited about the campaign. The student vote was an amazing aspect of our campaign. We paid attention to campus um, and and really made a connection that was very, very important. Once students graduate, a lot of times they don't have health care coverage. And so um, that was something that Tammy talked about a lot, that what are you going to do when you turn 25 or 24, you graduate, and you don't have health insurance? Tammy, 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 Tammy. On campus on election night on November 3rd, there were lines of people waiting to vote. They had underestimated how many people would turn out, and they ran out of ballots in ward after ward. We did it. And through our activism, commitment, and hopefulness, we also made a little history. It really was such a milestone. It was one of the happiest moments of my life, I think, when Tammy Baldwin won. I couldn't believe uh, that it was really happening for a long, long time that evening. And in fact, 
um, delayed coming over to the victory party until uh, almost all the numbers were in and that we were absolutely certain. Allow me to introduce to you the new congresswoman from the 2nd District of Wisconsin, Tammy Baldwin. Having someone like Tammy who is out and who is as respected as she undoubtedly will be, who will be so articulate, uh, they'll see her and they'll see her as a very effective congresswoman who is not at all embarrassed or unwilling to note the fact that she's a lesbian. She has that ability to, to disarm people. And I think that is one of the best benefits she will bring uh, to the dialogue in, in Washington. We have shown that in politics, it's okay to dream about the future we want to create. Gays and lesbians in America have fought a lot of fights to be led in the room. Tammy Baldwin, I think, is talking about a next step where gays and lesbians are accepted as human beings at the table. Every time I've taken a risk in politics, be it on an issue or uh, running for office myself, there have always been a group of cynics or naysayers saying, you know, it can't be done. Um, this has never been done before. When I first started in politics, I was told I was too young. Uh, at other points in time, I was told that I was too progressive. Um, you know, a woman had never been elected, and that lesbian had never been elected. There were always reasons not to do it. Sure, there were days I didn't know whether this could happen or not. There were many such days. But I always had faith. One of the um, sayings that we repeated over and over in the campaign was um, the, the famous quote from anthropologist Margaret Mead, who never doubt that a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that For all of us at In The Life, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month. Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Gill Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, the Collingwood Foundation, the Rainbow Endowment, William J. Resnick, and the annual support of In the Life members like you.